Hello, everyone. Welcome to the University of Maine Cooperative Extension's Gifts from the Kitchen webinar. I'm Lisa Fishman. Thank you for joining us for our last webinar of 2020. After the success of our food preservation webinar series earlier this year, we decided to continue the fun with more cooking and nutrition webinars. These webinars will deliver current research-based recommendations for healthy cooking using some of the produce from Maine farmers, tips for shopping local, and great food projects that will keep you busy and engaged this winter. We'll be joined today by my UMaine food team colleagues, Kate McCarty, Kathy Savoy, and Lori Bowen. The mission of the University of Maine Cooperative Extension is to help Maine people improve their lives through an educational process that uses research-based knowledge focused on issues and needs. Our educational programs include agriculture, horticulture, including master gardeners, 4-H youth development, food safety, and nutrition. Finally, we want to let you know that the University of Maine is prohibited from discriminating on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, disability, and reprisal or retaliation for prior civil rights activities. Today, we'll focus on making gifts from the kitchen. We'll cover how to prepare several edible gifts for the holidays and any food safety concerns around giving and receiving food. Some housekeeping, we have our webinar set up so that you can hear and see us, but we can't hear or see you. We want to answer your questions though, so please ask them as they come up for you during our presentation by using the Q&A feature, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Thanks again for joining us. Now let's get started. As you all well know, our holiday traditions may look a little different this year, thanks to COVID. COVID-19. Perhaps you're not traveling to see loved ones, maybe you've canceled the holiday party, or you're working from home and can't have the traditional office cookie swap. We're all forced to reimagine our holiday traditions this year for the safety of the public's health. So we're here to cheer you up with some ideas for homemade gifts that will help you feel connected to loved ones at a time when we all need some connection. Homemade food gifts can be a nice way to show your love for your friends and family. We're going to show you how to make several different homemade gifts that are relatively inexpensive. They ship well, and they make delicious and even healthy recipes for the gift recipient. We'll also make sure you're aware of any food safety risks so that your gifts are safe in addition to being delicious. You'll love these homemade gifts from the kitchen as they help you stay connected to loved ones near and far this holiday season. Now, before we dive in, we do wanna find out some information. So we're gonna begin with a poll. We would like to know, how did you hear about this webinar? Did you get an email from Extension? Was it on Facebook? Did you hear it from a friend? Was it in the newspaper? Did you see it on TV? Or was there some other way you heard about us? We'd love to know. Great. And just a couple more seconds on this. Three, two, one. Terrific. We're going to end that poll. So most of you, the vast majority of you heard about us from an email you received from Extension letting you know about this. But we also got some great Facebook friends out there. So and uh, really happy to hear about that. I'm very pleased um, with all ways that you're hearing about Cooperative Extension. Okay, we are going to head straight into the demo kitchen now and Kate is going to kick us off with our very first recipe. Thanks, Lisa. I'm disappointed to see nobody saw my interview with uh, a Kathy McCarty last week up in Arista County out of a, a TV station up there. <laughs> I was on TV last week with my doppelganger named Kathy McCarty instead of Kate McCarty. So herbal vinegar is my demo, my first demo. I've got three today for you. It's a great product. Um, it's easy to make. It's relatively inexpensive and you've got multiple opportunities to use either homegrown or locally grown ingredients throughout the process. Um, before I get into the demo though, I do want to say a quick note about food safety. 
which um, you might be wondering why I'm demonstrating how to make a flavored vinegar rather than a flavored oil. So of course, we've all seen these beautiful products in like an Italian restaurant or a TJ Maxx or something. It's a, a bottle of oil infused with um, vegetables or herbs. So unfortunately, we don't recommend making this product at home due to the risk of botulism. Um, so we are all very concerned around food safety and giving our gifts and making sure that our loved ones are receiving a product that's going to be safe for them to eat. So uh, it is definitely uh, recommended to avoid creating a product that has could run the risk of botulism. So when you introduce these fresh ingredients into oil, you create an anaerobic, low acid environment in which botulism could develop. So by swapping the oil out for vinegar, you can still have the same fun, create a beautiful product, um, and drop that food safety risk. We will send out a fact sheet around creating safe homemade flavored oils. If you are dead set on creating one at home, you can use dried ingredients for a safer final product. Um, but I'm hoping that most of you will be swayed by the herbal vinegar um, as it's so easy and has less of a food safety risk. So to begin, I have done a few things um, behind the scenes to prep for my herbal vinegar. So I've got my pint jar here that I've uh, washed up and then I've um, brought some vinegar to a simmer. So the vinegar I'm using is just a plain white vinegar. You can use any kind of vinegar you want, but you should be conscious of the fact that if you use a strongly flavored vinegar, it might overpower the flavoring ingredients that you add. So really we recommend like a um, white vinegar, apple cider vinegar, um, or even a white wine vinegar, but really just a plain base and then you're adding the infused ingredients. And you can um, use any kind of whole ingredient you want from herbs to spices to fruit, um, spicy, some vegetables like a spicy pepper or garlic. You can get really creative with the combination. So today I'm gonna to show you how to make a cranberry rosemary uh, vinegar in a, in a white vinegar base. And that's just because I like the way the, um, Ingredients look together. They really remind me of the holiday season with the red berries and the green herb sprigs. So for fresh herbs, you want to add two to three sprigs of herbs and add those right into the jar. And then for the fruit, I have a cup of cranberries, which I have previously frozen. So in our webinar series, we have done a topic on cranberries. So we have um, these frozen cranberries in the freezer. So I'm going to use just a cup of these and frozen is fine because we've heated our vinegar. So it's going to, um, that heat is going to thaw the berries and infuse the vinegar with their flavor. So I've got my flavoring ingredients in the jar. If you want to use dried herbs, you'll use three tablespoons of dried herbs. And then I put my um, heated vinegar. This was heated to about a simmer, so about 190 degrees. I put it in a measuring cup just to, for ease of pouring. And then fill your jars up. So if you're doing this for gifts, you'll likely have a bunch of them. So you could batch the recipe. Um, so you'll do an assembly line style and fill them up. And then you want to fill within a quarter inch of the top. So I've got my headspace measure to help me measure that one quarter inch, that first step up from the bottom, covering all my flavoring ingredients. And then add either um, your two-part metal canning lid, or understandably, if you want to save those for canning, since they were in such short supply, you could use a plastic storage cap. Um, and if you're planning to give this gift as a refrigerated product, um, you don't need to worry about it even being in a canning jar. So if you're going to um, tell the gift recipient that they need to keep it in the fridge, um, you can give it as is but this is just vinegar. So it is a product that you could can using a boiling water bath canner, in which case you'll wanna use canning jars. Um, so they're in the proper jars for when it's time to can. So after you've set up your ingredients for infusing, you'll let it stand for three to four weeks. So if you intend to give this as a holiday gift, that means that you should get started shortly. So you've got the um, time for it to be ready for the holidays. And then um, again, you'll strain out the ingredients and then fill your jars and give it as is, as a refrigerated product, or you'll heat the vinegar, sterilize your canning jars, um, fill the jars and can it for 10 minutes in a boiling water bath canner. And as you will see, these um, white plastic caps are not uh, leak proof. So <laughs> um, they do make a leak proof lid now from Ball. That might be a better option if you go the, the plastic route. So some other ideas for, um, types of herbal vinegar that you can use or that you can make. 
are there's an herbal mix so you can use any kind of herbs that you can grow or buy a fresh tarragon vinegar would be lovely you could also do a lemon dill peppercorn vinegar a spicy parsley vinegar which has mustard seeds and allspice or a raspberry vinegar so you could pull out your local fruit um, use your local herbs or just do stuff that's in season like the cranberries and we'll send out a fact sheet that details all this information so you can um, get dreaming about your own homemade herbal vinegars. And in the meantime, we're going to go over to Kathy for some more food safety guidance. Great. Thanks so much, Kate. It's nice to see all the different things that we can give as gifts this holiday season, and we will certainly be showcasing a few more in today's webinar. Um, so let's start by talking about the elephant in the room when it comes to food safety. Is it in fact safe to give homemade food gifts to others during this COVID-19 pandemic? And yes, is the answer. The CDC, the FDA, and the USDA are not aware of any reports at this time that suggest that COVID-19 can be transmitted from food or even from food packaging. So what we also know is important to reduce risk and are all hearing an awful lot about these days is the importance of being socially distanced and the importance of each of us wearing our masks. So this means that we need to rethink some of our norms around how we actually give gifts to our friends, our families, and our neighbors. And I want you to know that it is indeed possible to rethink how to swap gifts to comply with the CDC guidelines for social distancing. Um, we know that wearing masks and avoiding shared indoor space does reduce the risk for transmitting COVID-19. So again, get creative and think of ways to reduce your risk and your exposure. I wanna share with you a little story of a local group that I'm aware of that has um, in fact gotten creative and has in fact found a way um, to convert their usual indoor holiday community cookie swap to something that required a little bit of forethought, but is actually going to still take place this year. And they've simply switched up their system. And the cookie swap is now a pre-registered, coordinated curbside drop-off of individually pre-packaged, but of course, homemade cookies. And then they've coordinated a subsequent follow-up for a curbside pickup of the cookies that have been swapped by, in, by masked volunteers. They've even planned for a Zoom meeting to make um, the event have that social element and also be festive. And I know this group well enough, I can imagine there will be some virtual caroling that takes place as well. Um, and this is just one example of how we can rethink events to indeed reduce risk of exposure to COVID-19, but also while continuing with some of that uh, very much needed social merriment of the holiday season. So again, something to think about and also a challenge to get creative and stay within those guidelines of the CDC. When we switch gears and talk about um, general kitchen food safety, you know, the same rules apply. Remember that food should be handled during holidays as usual. Follow good hand hygiene, wash those hands frequently, and also food safety practices when handling food that include the following. Uh, purchase food from reputable sources. Remember to cook your foods thoroughly. Temperatures really matter. Um, and use good personal hygiene in addition to starting with a clean and also sanitized workspace, equipment, and kitchen. And um, there's also relatively new information that's coming out and being blasted widely, which is on the importance of not consuming raw cookie dough. Um, and it does have to do with the raw eggs that are in the batter, but also a surprise to a lot of people is that flour is a raw agricultural product and does need to be cooked prior to eating. 
there have been numerous um, outbreaks associated with consumption of raw cookie dough. Um, and when you're thinking of giving your gifts, make sure that you are putting your products in a food grade container. And also very important is to let folks know in advance that you will be dropping gifts off and the location that you will be placing them outside. Um, again, temperature matters. We don't wanna have fruit, foods either freeze or be left at um, a temperature that's dangerous for them, which would be more than two hours at the um, between 40 and 140 degrees. So again, plan ahead, let folks know where you're dropping stuff off outdoors. And if you are the recipient of food, um, and if you receive something that should be refrigerated and it is not cold, our recommendation is um, following with, when in doubt, throw it out, um, because we don't want you to be put at risk for a foodborne illness. And also um, be aware of if foods are leaking, and if they have leaked on things, uh, we recommend that you do not consume those simply because of the unknowns that are surrounding that product. So rest assured that we've included a lot of humane extension publications to our resource list. Um, it includes information on if you're planning on shipping meats, things like um, sausages, turkeys, lobster, um, remember that these foods need to have some temperature control in them and that that's important to remember if you are in fact shipping things. Uh, there are foods such as hard cheeses, sweets, fruitcakes, jams, jellies that do ship well and do not need temperature controls. But we wanna give you a word of caution. Do be aware that carriers do have shipping restrictions, particularly around volumes of liquid. Um, so be aware of that. Don't find yourself um, in a situation where things cannot be shipped because it's in too large of a container. And also we're all hearing about um, the shipageddon of 2020. Um, plan ahead, recognize that our uh, carriers are challenged with the volume of um, packages that are needing to be delivered this year and allow yourself plenty of lead time for the busy holiday shipping season. Um, and again, if you are either sending or dropping things off, again, the importance of letting the recipient know um, to be on the lookout for a package um, and that it does need to have attention given to it from a food safety standpoint. So those are all my food safety tips for right now. Um, if you have additional questions, make sure you're putting them in the Q&A box and we're gonna have time to answer some of those questions. And now we're gonna head back to the kitchen with Kate for another food demo. Kate? Thanks, Kathy. Funny, because I don't want my family thinking that I'm shipping them lobster for the holidays. <laughs> You're gonna be getting dried soup mixes. So. <laughs> so. These recipes I'm about to demonstrate are from our new resource. Um, well, I call it new, but it's been around for a while, but it just got a facelift. So these are 12 recipes um, that can be made as dry mixes and then given to your loved ones. Um, they have these great, uh, or it has a great booklet. That's the 12 recipes for you as the gift giver. And then it also comes with printable double-sided gift tags. So you can print these little tags and then attach them to the uh, mix and it will have the recipe that you can then make using the product and the nutrition facts on the back. So I'm gonna demonstrate the soup mix and an apple crisp topping, but there's other um, baking mixes, um, spice mixes, soup mixes, all kinds of other fun things. We'll be sending this to you after uh, the webinar today. So the first one up is the minestrone soup mix and it is layered into a quart jar. So I have a clean wide mouth quart jar. Um, you could use any kind of food safe container that you'd like that you can find. I know quart canning jars, we're fortunate to have a big stash in our closet um, from, from last year, but I know they are hard to find. So this might be the most valuable part of your gift at the end of the day. <laughs> um, but any kind of container that will be, hold at least um, four cups of dry goods will suffice. And you're gonna layer in your first three or four dry ingredients. I say three or four, or excuse me, it's four or five. So it's um, brown rice to start as a first layer. And then 
four layers of beans. I only had three types of dried beans, so that's what I'm using. Going with the um, use what you have on hand. Maybe you bought a bunch of dried beans in the spring and don't quite know what to do with them. This is a great place to reuse them. These are, this is an opportunity to use some local ingredients. So these are really beautiful. King of the early dried beans, the one that looked kind of like a kidney bean from a local farm. These are actually part of my friend got a dry goods CSA um, and she gave me some beans and whole wheat flour, which was also a really nice gift. And then a layer of black beans, which are the midnight black turtle beans. So again, you can use whatever you have on hand. The recipe calls for kidney, great northern, and yellow eye beans, as well as these split peas. So all four layers of the dry ingredients there. And that's all that goes into the jar for now. Everything else goes in bags so that it can be cooked separately. So the, the brown rice and the dried beans, of course, are going to take the longest to cook. So you want to have the other ingredients that don't take as long stored separate. So we have these little snack size bags that I'm going to put one cup of um, the recipe calls for a macaroni or other small pasta. This is a spetzel that my brother-in-law gave me. I forget why. I think we had a conversation about spetzel and then he shipped me like two pounds of spetzel, which was very kind. And I'm going to put a cup of it. So this is spetzel. It's just pasta with this little rustic shape for those of you who might be unfamiliar. Put it in this little bag here. You actually want to make sure it has space to bend because you're going to need to curve it to fit in there. So I might need to ax some of the spetzel so that it's got some room for flexibility. We'll see if that works. And then I've got my spice mixes. So one bay leaf, a tablespoon of on dried onion, and then half a teaspoon of garlic powder and half a teaspoon of oregano. And really these are just suggestions for spicing. You could add a little more of different spices if you want to get creative there. And seal that up. So then the dry ingredients go in on top of your layered bean and rice mix here. This is where the spetzel is a little tight in the bag. I'll work on that off camera to get it a little more situated. Tuck the spice mix in there. And then those two should take up the remaining space so that you can, if you need to ship it, you can put it on its side and not ruin your pretty layers. Um, so that's the goal is to be able to take up all the space in there. So then you can apply your two part metal canning lid. Again, those are in short supply. So if you want to save that for yourself and give away a plastic storage cap, those are nice too. And then that's actually a great application for the dried mix because it won't, leaking is not a concern. And then I have a, the tag already tied on a finished one, another finished one with a cute little bow. And this has the macaroni in it. Um, so then this card, of course, tells your gift recipient how to make the soup. So to take out the dry ingredients and how to cook the beans um, and then add some additional stock, stock and vegetables, carrots, celery, et cetera. So there you go. You could layer these up really quickly and have a bunch of gifts for mail carriers, teachers, et cetera, loved ones in your life. Love it. Okay. Next up is an apple crisp topping. So same idea, just a smaller jar. So this is a pint jar, it's two cups and it's wide mouth, helps you get the jars in there in nice even layers. And this is a great, I just love it. I don't know, it seems really simple. I'm just really tickled by it. I think it would just be really nice to have this in the pantry as a starter for a crisp. Um, so it's simply oats, um, rolled oats. I have some from a local grain mill. So this is main grains, rolled oats, uh, brown sugar. So it's a half a cup of each um, oats, brown sugar. And then this is another um, product from that dry goods CSA that my friend is in. It's through Songbird Farm, if anyone's curious. Um, this is a warthog whole wheat flour variety, which I love the name of. And then um, it's a half a teaspoon of cinnamon and nutmeg just mixed together. So these ingredients just get layered in the jar. And the wide mouth helps too, if you want, need to be able to put your hand in there to kind of even out the layers as they go in. Like the brown sugar is definitely gonna need to be, ooh, kind of a little dry since I prepped it for my, prepped it this morning, a little stuck in here. Okay. The brown sugar's going in. 
Okay, I can see where you need to break that up a little bit. Okay. Above all, we want these to look nice, right? And then the oops, whole wheat flour covering the top. Oh, and that's like the perfect height, which I love. I was wondering how full that was going to be. But again, this is good for creating those layers. So it won't shift too much if you do ship it to somebody and it ends up going on its side in a box or something. Okay, so this is the apple crisp topping. So of course it comes with a recipe for making an apple crisp. You can tie it on there. I've got some nice little um, what do they call this stuff? Butcher's twine. Um, and it tells you how to make an apple crisp. So that is our two mixes. There's 10 more in the cards that we're going to be sending you this afternoon. So sounds like you all have a great weekend project. And so now we are going to Miss Lisa, who's going to talk with us about decorating all of our edible gifts. Thank you, Kate. And decorating your home gate, homemade gifts can be almost as much fun as making them. And it doesn't have to be very costly. You can accessorize your gifts with little tie-ins, such as recipe cards that are tied together with some raffia and a small cookie cutter. Decorative items are easily found in your craft room or from department stores or even thrift stores and yard sales. Look for an assortment of colors of fabrics and ribbon, little bells, beads, and other suitable bling. For inspiration from nature, you can head outdoors and gather pine cones or sprigs of evergreens or even herbs that might not have already succumbed to the frost and snow. Cinnamon sticks make a fragrant decoration. If you're making cookie mixes, a thoughtful decoration for your mix might be a cookie cutter. They can be found easily and are usually quite affordable, and they make cute and thoughtful additions to your baking mix gift. Oftentimes at this time of year, you can score some colored cellophane from the store for wrapping some of your already baked goodies that you may be gifting. Gifts from the, the whoops, that you may be gifting. The resource we will be sharing, Gifts from the Kitchen, comes with printable tags and instructions that you can add to your homemade items, as Kate was just mentioning. You can attach those with colorful ribbon and your gift will look quite special. You may have found that finding those canning jars of any size this year is a tricky little bit. No fear, most of these mixes don't require actual canning jars, so feel free to use any other jars that you may have on hand or that you can find in a local shop. This is a great time to pull out some of those older canning jars, the ones with the glass lids and the wire bales. They're not good for canning in, but you can certainly put mixes in them and doll them up. Perhaps you found food grade plastic containers with lids or cellophane bags. As long as they are food grade material, they are acceptable to use to hold your homemade food gifts. I have some very decorative bottles at my house that I've used for flavored vinegars. And they're very similar in the vinegars to the ones that Kate made just a little earlier. Ball started producing colored canning jars a few years ago. And some people don't like to can food in them because they're not clear, but these colored canning jars make very pretty containers for layered baking and soup mixes. And lastly, you can get as creative as you want with your packaging. You can use a large soup ladle, for instance, to hold your minestrone soup, the one that's shown here in the picture. Or you can use a pot holder with a pocket on it to hold your baking mixes. And you can doll those up with some raffia in your tag and a, perhaps a whisk and a wooden spoon, which will be uh, very helpful to the gift recipient when they go to make that mix up. Be sure to label your products with the name of the item and don't forget to attach those instructions. Ball has some really wonderful downloadable labels on their website that you might want to check out. Let's go back to Kate now in the kitchen and she's going to tell us a little bit about giving and receiving canned goods during this holiday season. Thanks Lisa. So yes, I tend to think of canned goods as a big staple of um, gifts around the holiday season. 
it's very convenient for me because I can all year long. So I just have this uh, canning pantry that is, you know, kind of at the height of its um, inventory this time of year, since I haven't, you know, gone through a bunch of different of the, of the product yet. So I pulled a selection of stuff that I canned this year that I thought would make for nice gifts. Of course, I canned all of this um, throughout the growing season while the food was in season. So some of it might not be um, accessible to you. Of course, you're not going to be able to make the peach barbecue sauce using local fresh peaches. Um, but if you followed along during our webinars this summer, you might have a um, freezer full of product like tomatoes or frozen fruit that then you could pull out and spend an afternoon turning into um, a canned product that you can give at, at the holidays. So um, I do that a lot for jams and jellies in the summer. I can't or I freeze all my fruit. And then when my personal jam stash runs low, I have an inventory frozen fruit that's local in season preserved at the height of its ripeness that I can pull from to produce whatever I want. So I did that this in April using frozen strawberries, uh, main strawberries that I'd frozen the June prior. So I made a strawberry ginger hot honey jam. So of course, because it's a honey jam that indicates that I used a, a pectin that allowed for that type of um, sweetener. So make sure that if you go down this creative jam making route that you use a low sugar or no sugar needed pectin that allows for you to use an alternative sweetener. Um, I also did this great garlic pear preserve. So you could find, and of course, if you're someone who's less concerned about local and just concerned about um, making the creative product, you can of course go to the grocery store and purchase these products um, to make all these recipes, even in December in Maine, like this garlic pear preserve. So this has thyme, sugar, pectin, it's a gel product. Um, you roast the garlic and pears, and then together um, it makes a really nice uh, spread in addition to like a cheese board. And of course you can just eat it on toast. Um, with the frozen cranberries um, out of our freezer, you can make a cranberry chutney, a cranberry conserve. I believe that Kathy's mom, Joanne, does a conserve. So that's um, a gelled fruit product that has nuts in it and maybe raisins. They'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the chutney definitely has raisins in it. So that's a fun pickled product, the chutneys, um, to give us gifts. You can also do an apple chutney using local apples. Um, the peach barbecue sauce, a tomato jam, a pickled cauliflower. Kathy and I did that as a kind of experiment. Um, they turned out really well. And our favorite candied jalapenos, so a, make a sweet syrup with sugar and vinegar and candy these slices of jalapenos. So these are all um, fun products that I've created throughout the year that I could give as gifts. You could also um, make a pickled beets or a relish using local products, make a main blueberry jam using a spiced um, main blueberries from your freezer or even from a commercial product um, from the grocery store. Lots of great options um, for you to page through those canning cookbooks. Now that the growing season and the summer uh, have gone by, it feel, life feels a little less frantic. Maybe you have some time to dedicate to, well, for me, it does at least, I can't speak for everyone this time of year, um, but you might have some time to uh, dedicate an afternoon to creating a creative product out of um, either frozen fruit or um, something you can purchase at the store. So it is very important that you use a recommended recipe. Of course, you can turn to good old Google and put in whatever you want and find a recipe for it. That does not, however, mean it is canned using sound and research canning practices. So of course, the resources we send you after today's webinar will be the ones we recommend, the National Center for Home Food Preservation, um, Fall, and our Let's Preserve series. So peruse those and find a recipe. You're certainly welcome to ask me if you have any questions about um, a product or recipe that you find. And then when you give your gift, it's important to let your gift recipient know how they should use your product. Not only some ideas, of course, for how they can eat it and enjoy it. Um, the cranberry chutney, I went to a um, socially distanced outdoor barbecue this summer where we mixed chutney with the cream cheese and it made for a great dip. So it's a really simple suggestion to share with your gift recipient. But let them know that they should store it. If you've added the screw band and some like cute fabric, they should remove that to store it. Store it in a cool, dark, dry place. And then once you open the product, keep it in the refrigerator and use it within two weeks um, for best quality. Now, if the tables are turned and you're on the other side of receiving canned goods, I certainly have been um, on that end where you've received some, some jars of food that you were not sure how they were canned or they might show something that looks um, 
not so appetizing. It is a delicate situation. So of course we recommend being very gracious to the person that you receive the gift from. Um, but if you notice that a large amount of headspace, so for jams and jellies, let's say it's just a quarter of an inch of headspace. So the jam and jelly should be very close to the top of the jar. If it's a, you know at least an inch or more, um, or sometimes um, the, the person giving you the gift might not have canned it at all using the open kettle method, which is not recommended any longer, or perhaps the jar has come unsealed for some reason. So you get a jar where the lid is not sealed on at all. Um, unfortunately, we do recommend that you discard those products as tempting as it is to enjoy it. It might be sound really good. And of course you hate to discard someone's handiwork. Um, it's really not worth the risk of anything that um, might result from an improperly home canned good. So that's a tough, delicate situation to end on. Um, but with that, we are going to go to Lori to see what questions people might have. And if people don't have a lot of questions, what I would suggest is sharing um, any homemade gifts that you've made that have worked well for you. We'd love to hear your ideas. Thank you, Kate. We do have a question from Jennifer and it's for Kathy. Um, the canning quilt behind you is fantastic. Can you tell us about it? I sure can. And I totally agree that it is fantastic. Um, as you can see, it is a wall hanging and maybe we can spotlight me so we can see it up close a little bit more. Um, but it does have um, the one, two, three, four, five by four um, quilt of canning jars using a variety of fabrics. It is something that I have treasured for many years. I was surprised um, when I looked at the date on it, it actually was made um, as a gift um, in 1998. So it's been hanging on the wall for quite a while. Um, it is the type of wall hanging that you can uh, you know, adjust accordingly um, for the size wall that you wanna hang it on. I have another one that I believe is uh, three by four. So it's um, a little less wide, but just as long. And it is a beautiful way to highlight perhaps some favorite fabrics um, from your past or from your family. Um, or help to tell the story of someone's uh, personality. Uh, so this quilted wall hanging was actually gifted to my mom um, and it has a lot of fabrics in it that um, speak to who she is and her personality. And then I have a separate one and there are other quilt fabrics in it that speak to me and my personality. Um, so again, it is a quilt pattern that I think can be found on the internet um, it is a beautiful, beautiful item to have. So I think I did recently see it posted as an actual uh, quilt for a bed, um, but I just have it as wall hanging. So um, in addition to discussing that, I also wanted to uh, pull up another picture that um, features, because we don't have many questions in the box, and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some gifts from the kitchen that I had the um, honor of delivering today. So Kate, if you could pull up that slide. Um, here is a wonderful example of how someone has um, taken the time and um, energy to pull together some wonderful gifts from their kitchen to share with another um, loved one. So what you see here are um, an example of a quick bread that has a wonderful um, little something special from the outdoors to make it festive, as well as um, two canning, um, two canned items. Those are dilly beans and then pickled beets that are some um, favorites in the family, as well as um, party mix. Don't overlook the importance of something salty and crunchy to give as a gift. And it is in a glass jar. So again, avoiding um, a lot of plastics and featuring things that can be recycled. Um, one of the favorites in this cluster of gifts from the kitchen that I wanted to show is on the left-hand side of the slide, and that is some candied orange rinds. So that is a wonderful um, old-fashioned um, type of food that you can 
create. It does take some time. It does take some energy. Um, it is truly an expression of your love, um, but it is something that can be given as part of a gift for the kitchen from the kitchen. Um, so old fashioned candy rinds, and those are both orange and grapefruit candy rinds. And I see that we have some other questions in the Q&A box, so I'll pass it back to Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Marjorie has a question. Um, how do you tell if any kind of nuts are rancid? So I can field that question. Rancid nuts are certainly something you want to avoid. Um, nuts are you know, pretty high in oils and the types of oils that um, may not be shelf stable at room temperature for long periods of time. So it is recommended that um, you store your nuts in the refrigerator or even the freezer to help extend their shelf life so that you don't have those um, oils go rancid. And you can usually tell if they're rancid um, by smelling them. They will have an off smell, sort of an acrid smell. Um, they can also be tasted and they will um, have just an off taste to them. So you know you wanna get rid of them. Okay. Marianne, Marianne has a suggestion. Um, try making cranberry, pear, quince chutney, and pear apple quince conserve. That sounds yummy. Um, and then we also have a question. What is the shelf life of the crisp topping? So the crisp topping um, is recommended to keep for two months. And it does actually say that on the tag. So you're, uh, all of these have the shelf life on them. So your recipient will have that information printed on the tag, which is nice. And we were debating this before the, the webinar. So the apple crisp topping is recommended to be stored in the refrigerator. And along the same vein of where we we're talking about the oils in um, nuts, you might consider, it's printed on the tag. So we'll go with that. You would recommend um, storing this in the refrigerator because it has the whole, um, oats as well as the whole wheat flour. So storing it in the refrigerator isn't going to hurt anything. Um, so we would we were going to stick with that recommendation and then use it within the two months recommended. Thanks, Kate. Um, Jennifer also wanted to share each year my kids and I make homemade peppermint marshmallows and then create a layered jar of cocoa mix with different cocoa powder, chocolate chips, and white chocolate with the homemade marshal marshmallows on top. That is delicious. <laughs> okay, and then um, Audrey would also like to know, what is the shelf life of the herb vinegars? Oh, good question. Um, the herbal vinegars, so if you can them, if you prepare your vinegar, strain out the flavoring ingredients, and then process the finished vinegar, those will be good for a year. Um, once they've been sealed. If you're giving it as a refrigerated product, it's recommended to use it within three months of keeping it in the fridge the whole time. Okay, that looks like all the questions we have for right now. So I will send it back over to Lisa. Uh, perhaps before we head back to Lisa, I could build on um, that lovely comment about the cocoa with the homemade peppermint marshmallows, which is a great idea. And it just reminded me of the gift that we um, decided that I gave to folks last year, which was um, a turmeric latte mix. So it was all sorts of um, dried spices and mixed up in a jar and then gave that to them um, with a plant-based milk um, to make their own latte at home. So that was another fun um, gift from the kitchen that uh, goes along with that sort of beverage theme. So off to Lisa. Sounds delicious. Thanks for sharing that. So we do have some information on our recommended resources and those are right here. You'll get all of these resources included in the follow-up email, including our directory of Maine farm products so you can shop locally. Next month, believe it or not, we'll launch our 2021 webinar series on Tuesdays at two o'clock. On January 12th, we'll begin with using unusual Maine vegetables. 
and other topics for the series so far will include making savory pies and cooking with electric pressure cookers, also known as instant pots in some cases, and reducing food waste in your kitchen. We'll share an email with resources and recipes from today's topic and registration information for our next webinar. We want to thank you all for joining us today and we wish you all a very happy holiday season. Stay safe out there. Bye everyone.